Our jobs, much like a late night trip to the Taco Bell drive through often lead us to desperately cry out, how can there still be more shit? But somehow there always is, which is why we've dedicated a whole segment to it that we call How Bullshit Is It? So tell us, Heath, what cattle prattle will we battle today? We're going to be talking about chemtrails. Oh, nice. I can't believe it's taken this long. Yeah, we had to loop back around in the alphabet. I wanted to do chemotherapy, but apparently that's real. Did you yeah, guys no, know that? It's a, a real thing. Citation yeah. needed. <laughs> so, so tell us, Heath, what are chemtrails? That was a joke. It's definitely real. Chemotherapy. We don't believe trails. in chemotherapy. <laughs> Let's just, just be 100% clear. Yeah. My, my dad lived an extra like 30 years because of it. Okay. Chemtrails is a portmanteau of chemical and <laughs> trails. Are they, are they anything else? Well, they're bullshit, but we usually save that for the end. So, See, yeah. You know what? I should, it's, that's on me. I should have learned to be more specific on the opening question. So tell us, Heath, what would a credulous conspiracy theorist tell me that chemtrails are? Well, like a lot of the old school conspiracy theories, there's actually not much agreement on what they are beyond evil and chemicals. But the connective thread that runs through all the different theories is people looking at airplane contrails and deciding to hide from them just in case. Yeah, it's as close as conspiracy theorists get to telling us that the sky is falling and I am <laughs> here for it. <laughs> it's also exactly old man yells at cloud, depending on the age and gender of the conspiracy theorists. Ooh, oh, it's true. It is. Yeah. Okay, so, so to be clear, we're just talking about normal contrails, the little exhaust clouds behind airplanes? Well, not any contrails. Chemtrails are distinguished by the fact that they persist for hours and often spread out into cirrus clouds. Proponents of the conspiracy argue that contrails would need additional chemicals in them to stay in the sky over such a long period. Okay, is that based on any facts? Facts? No, of course not. Okay, so not that I need it or anything, but I'm sure it would be helpful to some people if you could remind us what contrails actually are. Okay. Don't worry, Heath. I've got this one. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Noah, when you flush an airplane toilet, it has to first turn your peepers and poopers into candy floss what? so it doesn't land on people at high speed no, no, and kill no, them none like of Joe that. Dirt. None of that. So contrail is a portmanteau of condensation trail. They're formed when an airplane's very hot exhaust meets the upper atmosphere's very cold air. It's no different than water beating up on a cold can of beer on a hot day. Real women, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, though. There's no can of beer, though, for it to condense on up there. So it stays in the air, and the air is so cold that it freezes. So what we're seeing is a cloud of tiny ice crystals trailing behind the plane. Well, and, and they persist for varying amounts of time, like even when they're not carrying evil chemicals? Yeah. <laughs> the determining factor is humidity. If the air around them is really dry, the contrails dissipate quickly. If it's near saturation, they linger. And because the ice crystals vary in size, some fall quicker than others, so they spread out vertically. And because wind speeds vary, depending on altitude, they can spread out horizontally. So if they hang around long enough, they turn into sheets of cirrus clouds. Look, I know what Heath is saying is true, but on behalf of the stupid people like myself listening to this podcast, can I just say the government releases Jewish gay chemicals makes a lot more sense than floating <laughs> ice crystals. I just I want to be out there with it. Fair enough. All right, yeah. All right, so now you refer the, to this as an old school conspiracy theory. How long has this one been around? It got started in 1996 when the U.S. Air Force published a report about weather modification. The report was called Weather as a Force Multiplier, Owning the Weather in 2025. And it was entirely speculative. It was almost certainly the byproduct of some congressman saying, well, how do we know them Chinese ain't making the hurricanes during like a classified hearing at some point? in 1996. And it basically concluded that weather manipulation is a silly thing from science fiction, and it's not something the Air Force should be wasting their time on. Okay, so so in the middle of the 90s, the Air Force publicly released a report that said we sure aren't doing any weather manipulation. <laughs> I, I, so I, I guess I could see why conspiracy theorists' ears perked up at that. Yeah, mine did too. Because if we've learned anything from dozens of documentaries on god-awful movies, it's that everyone openly announces their conspiracy theory yes. in easily searchable <laughs> documents. Don't they, though? The perfect crime, Eli, the is rules. the perfect crime. Hiding in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> also, keep in mind, this is 1996 I'm talking about. 
people are still using free hours from AOL CDs. They're not the <laughs> savvy, incredulous consumers of information that we have today. So <laughs> right, yeah. when news of this report started circulating online, people immediately accused the Air Force of spraying the U.S. population with mysterious substances and creating unusual contrail patterns. In 1999, it was picked up by radio host Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM, and it entered the mainstream of popular bullshit. I'm sorry, they're accusing the Air Force of spraying deadly chemicals on us and doing loop-de-loops? I feel like you'd stick to just one of those accusations. Yes. <laughs> okay, but, but wait, hold on. So, so were they accusing the Air Force of having always sprayed Americans with mysterious substances? Because contrails were a thing before 1990. Like, I remember them. Right, yeah. So an enormous amount of this whole conspiracy rests on the completely unevidenced claim that before the mid-90s, contrails didn't persist as long. But they did. I grew up by an airport. We definitely yep. had contrails. Like There are photographs from when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Are there? I don't think there were cameras back then. <laughs> Fuck. No, I'm okay, yeah. So, of step. course, there are photographs of contrails. The Wikipedia article shows contrails from World War II, actually. But what they don't have is photographs of contrails lingering for hours. <laughs> so, all right. Look, I try to bring more sophisticated objections to this segment than nah, uh but I don't know if this merits one. No, you're good, you're good with nah. -uh. <laughs> but, like, I, I don't think that the atmosphere has gotten wetter over time. So this, this, is, this is like basing your conspiracy theory on the idea that grass wasn't green back in 2007. Okay, but to be fair, there had been a large increase in the number of persistent contrails the average person observed over time because there were a lot more airplanes over time. So a person who's in their 50s when this nonsense all started, like Art Bell, looks up into the sky after hearing the theory and thinks to himself, you know, uh, when I was a kid, there were fewer contrails in the sky. And, you know, he's not wrong. He's just too stupid to consider the very obvious alternate <laughs> explanation. Yeah. Also, if you find yourself thinking the sentence, you know, when I was a kid, there wasn't blank. It's probably just a good thing you should find and just accept that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, so this all stems from the fact that airplanes weren't the one form of technology that didn't get more ubiquitous in the 20th century then? In more ways than one. Yeah. Another piece of evidence, I say that with air quotes, that believers will point to is that you often see contrails in grids across large areas as though they're trying to dissipate their evil chemicals evenly over a broad area. Okay, so wait, so so the fact that airplanes travel in the way that makes them least likely to, like, run into each other, that's <laughs> evidence of the conspiracy? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. I mean, yes, airplanes have always been constructed in grid patterns, but air travel has to reach a certain level of ubiquity before people tend to notice that from the contrails. All right, so is... I feel in my heart that contrails used to be less stubborn, all the evidence they have. <laughs> Sadly, no. Because when you define evidence as broadly as conspiracy theorists do, you can always find more. For example, they'll often present a photograph of a commercial airliner filled with mysterious tanks of unknown liquid where the seats are supposed to go. And that's meant to be evidence that the planes dispersing the evil chemicals are disguised as passenger planes, but in reality, there's nothing mysterious about the tanks, and the liquid is very much known. It's water. It's <laughs> hydrogen hydroxide. They use tanks of water as a substitute for passenger weight so they can simulate taking off and landing in a plane filled with different capacities of weight. So nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Even most of the true believers actually had to abandon that one. After all, the Illuminati would never let an actual photograph of one of their chemtrail planes circulate online, obviously. <laughs> okay, but what I love about this is that the airlines then had to be like, hey guys, the crazy people think our water bottle test is Jew poison. Does anyone know how heavy <laughs> you can make a mannequin? I think we have to make <laughs> right, heavy yes. mannequins. Yeah, <laughs> but there are a couple of videos that they still cling to. One is of a plane dumping fuel before an emergency landing, and the other is just a plane landing in the fog. Now, proponents will tell you the video shows the plane emitting chemtrails, but it's literally just fog moving around the slipstream of the plane because that's what fog does when you blow 
jet exhaust at it. Okay, so they've got misidentified photographs and misidentified videos. <laughs> they do, but that's not all. I mean, if the Illuminati is out there poisoning the air with evil chemicals, you should be able to find the evil chemicals, right? And you should be able to find them in greater concentrations in places where there are lots of chemtrails, right? Okay, but but hold on a second, because the, the places with more air traffic are, generally speaking, going to be more populous areas to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> right. I can think of a lot of reasons why you'd find higher levels of various pollutants in places with greater air traffic that don't involve evil conspiracies to randomly poison the populace. Okay, love where your head's at, but you're way overestimating these people. It would honestly be something of a relief if those were the kinds of mistakes they were making. But instead, we get shit like... They captured the air samples they would later test for heavy metals in jars with metal lids. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah, it's like how I figured out that detectives committed every murder, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's all about the fingerprints, Noah. So one of my favorite examples of this kind of absurdity comes from conspiracy heavyweight Jim Mars. That's the JFK guy who cited an air quality test that a Louisiana television station did in 2007 as proof of chemtrails. When the reporters did the test, they found barium at 6.8 parts per million, which is three times the U.S. nationally recommended limit. But when skeptics examined the video from that station, it turned out the reporters were misusing the equipment in a way that exaggerated the readings by a factor of 100. Oh, uh-huh. And there was no more barium fun dip for anyone at the carnival that summer. <laughs> Thanks, Heath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so up to this point, you, you've just been talking about evil chemicals in general. So is barium evil? Evil? Sure, I guess it can be. But here's the thing. As much as possible, chemtrail believers will hide behind general terms like toxins or nerve agents. There's pretty much no agreement on exactly what is being dumped on the populace. But conspiracy theorists never met a ridiculous anomaly they didn't like. So if signs show unsafe levels of barium, for example, then yes, of course, barium was the toxic nerve agent all along. And then they can work backwards from there to see how barium could advance the nefarious goals of the Illuminati. Okay, but what are those goals? Like, why would the government <laughs> want to secretly spray us with barium? Qui bono? Great question. Again, there's very little consistency here. If I wanted to, I could probably present a dozen different incompatible theories just from InfoWars alone. But instead, we're going to limit this to what I think of as the big three in terms of chemtrail conspiracies. Jews, gays, and Jewish gay people. <laughs> <laughs> it's close to correct. So the first is the most reasonable, which I only point out as a condemnation of the other two, not a defense of this one. It's still really stupid. It's the idea that the government is secretly controlling the weather but they haven't sufficiently safety tested the chemicals they're using. And these chemicals are causing a bunch of illness that the government can't acknowledge because the weather control program is a secret. All right, everyone. Good news. Michigan winter, a little less harsh this year. Downside, eyeball aids. We have given <laughs> everyone eyeball aids. Of course, the idea that the government would just accidentally sicken and kill their populace doesn't sit well with most conspiracy theorists. So this one often gets inflated to the point where the government knows that the chemical is dangerous, but they also decided that killing civilians is a small price to pay for that sweet, sweet weather control. And in a bit of right-wing conspiracy symbiosis, controlling the weather often gets swapped out with slowing down the effects of climate change, creating a sort of conspiracy double whammy. Okay, I, I know it's silly to bother injecting logic here, but presumably the people plotting this thing also live in America, as do their families. So the idea here is that they're willing to, like, murder their own families with eyeball aids in an effort to predict which days will be rainy? <laughs> well, in some versions of the story, sure. But you have to keep in mind that contrails only persist under certain weather conditions. So most chemtrail believers claim that we're being poisoned every now and again on a set schedule. That way, the elite people can make sure their families are off in the south of France during those weeks. I'm telling you, darling, you must see Paris during Jew poison season. It's the <laughs> only time to go. 
All right. Well, we're glad to have the most reasonable one out of the way. You, you said you had more? <laughs> yeah. Second one is just straight up genocide. One of the repeating themes of grand conspiracy theories is that the elite want to reduce the world population so that we don't run out of resources. Because, you know, what are the billionaires and government leaders going to do? Monopolize scarce resources while the rest of us do without? It'd be unsustainable. So spray <laughs> deadly poison on people from 30,000 feet is what they came up with for this one. Okay, and I'm not trying to give the Illuminati notes here or anything, but wouldn't that be a terrible way to disperse poison? Sure the fuck would, yeah. <laughs> From that height, it could take like a day and a half to fall, and there'd be no way of predicting where it would fall exactly, right. or how much would fall, or what concentration it would fall in. Unless you also controlled the weather with different chemtrails. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay, sure. But the point is that if you wanted to poison a population with an aerosol, you would drop it from a low altitude. And you'd also probably do it at night. And you definitely wouldn't use a chemical agent that's white and puffy and starkly <laughs> visible from six miles down for hours at a time. Sorry, Heath, just to clarify, you know, for listeners who might be curious for completely innocent reasons, when you say low altitude. For, for, for no. the last time, Eli, the company is not renting you a crop duster and some very nice people live in Mississippi. I hate being the new guy. So Okay, <laughs> sorry, Heath. You said there was a, a third main theory, too? Yeah, the one you're most likely to come across, in my experience, is the idea that the chemical agent they're spraying is designed to keep people docile. Yes, because if there's one thing a country that measures lost productivity because I was too busy scrolling to realize I was done with this shit in the billions of dollars needs, <laughs> it's help being docile. Am I right? Yes, us Americans. Yeah. <laughs> there's also a version of this one where the goal is to keep us perpetually sick since they can make more money selling us expensive drugs and we're too sick to rise up in class rebellion at that point. Wait, so, so hold on. So in order to sell us more drugs, they're dispersing drugs? Drugs, yeah. But cheap ones, presumably. So. Oh, sure, well, right. yeah. Oh, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Okay. I feel silly asking this, but I kind of have to. How do we know this isn't true? Um, other than the fact that it's scientifically unfeasible, completely unevidenced, and obviously would have been leaked to the public by now. Yeah, like other than that. Other than that. Uh -huh. The Illuminati okay. are really good at keeping secrets, guys, except for your uncle who doesn't know how to do Facebook on his phone. He's ahead of them, <laughs> but everyone else. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the chemtrail conspiracy has been spread so far and wide that multiple governments have actually felt the need to respond to them directly. In 2000, a multi-agency response from the EPA, the FAA, the NOAA, and NASA reassured Americans that no mysterious poisons were being dumped onto them to keep them docile and make the frogs gay. Well, I'm sure that assuaged the fears of the conspiracists. <laughs> yeah. Well, the response was basically, why would all of those agencies respond if they didn't have anything to cover up? Of course it was. Naturally. And by 2001... So many people were convinced by the conspiracy that there was actually a half-hearted effort to address it in U.S. Congress. Well, sort of. Former Democratic congressman and prolific tree-based cookie baker, Dennis Kucinich, introduced a bill called the Space Preservation Act of 2001 that would permanently prohibit space weapons, and it specifically named chemtrails among the exotic weapons it would ban. Well, the Department of Defense looked at the bill and they were like, hold on, what if we want to put exotic weapons in space, though? So the bill died in committee, thanks to the DOD. And of course, Congress's failure to outlaw chemtrails was forevermore presented as evidence that they were already doing it the whole time. Yeah, it's not a good look for Congress, but for a different reason than the conspiracy <laughs> yeah, theorists right, are right. saying. Yeah. And the U.S. wasn't the only government that felt the need to respond to this nonsense theory. A petition in Canada reached whatever threshold of signatures triggers there, now the government actually has to look into this provision. So Canadian Parliament looked at all the evidence, which was none, and released a statement that read in part, quote, there is no substantiated evidence, scientific or otherwise, to support the allegation that there is high altitude spraying conducted in Canadian airspace, end quote. Sorry, Heath, not to bury the lead here, but there's a signature amount where the Canadian government 
has to answer my dumb shit questions because <laughs> I have an amazing idea for a prank war. How many listeners do we have? Like 100 million? Do we have 100 million? Yeah, we have like 100 million. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so, so wait, the only evidence is a denial by the accused party and a complete lack of evidence in, in the affirmative. Actually, there's more. So keep in mind that toxic chemicals in the air is the kind of thing we need to keep track of, whether or not they're being intentionally sprayed by shape-shifting Jewish lizard aliens. So a number of different groups are constantly monitoring air quality. And these range from government agencies to state universities to privately funded environmental groups. So the idea that some exotic chemical is being blanketed over the country without anybody noticing is pretty much impossible. Well, unless they're all in on the conspiracy. Ooh, <laughs> right. interesting. Of course. So just like pretty much every single grand conspiracy theory, the sheer number of accomplices it would require leaves the whole thing crushed under its own weight. All right. Well, I guess the only question left to ask is, how bullshit is it? Great question. It's such bullshit that it doesn't even get mentioned in David Icke's book, Everything you need to know, but have never been told. Until chapter 15, which we are doing <laughs> next. There we is, haven't got there, there yet. Are. 42 mentions when I did a control F of chemical oh, oh, yeah. for the rest of the book. All right. Well, I guess with the audience thusly looped, we're going to wrap things up for tonight. But don't worry, there will always be more bullshit to come.